Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I was asked to speak at this event, uh, which is called Four Years From Now, about how is, the, how is it going to look the, the future four years from now, what kind of technologies are going to be changing um, you know, what, uh, what we do uh, within the next four years or, or more. Um, so let me see if I can put the slides here. There you go. Oops. So um, I, I had a daughter uh, almost uh, a little bit over a year ago. And then, uh, you know, when you have a daughter um, after you're 40, <laughs> then you start seeing the world differently and start thinking, how is the, how is, how is the world going to be when she's, you know, a teenager, or when she's uh, an adult, or when she becomes 40 like I'm now? What, what are the kind of, like, things that are going to be transformational uh, for, for her that, you know, will be completely different than, than what we see today? And the reason I keep thinking about this is because um, at the moment, we are in the middle of uh, what people call the digital revolution, uh, which is probably the, the biggest revolution in history since the Industrial Revolution, uh, which you probably know was very transformational for society, for people, for the way uh, goods were produced, how people transport, uh, how people live, etc., uh, etc. Et and we are at the moment, we, we won't recognize it until the future. It's going to take years to recognize um, the moment we're living in because this, the, the revolutions are, are something that people don't understand until they have uh, already passed. So what's the meaning of revolution? So um, a revolution um, is something that has three characteristics. One is unstoppable. So no matter what anyone wants to do, at the moment we're living, uh, we're living in a digital revolution that is going to transform the world, and there's no one that can do anything to stop it. This is going to happen no matter what, whether governments, whether corporations, uh, individuals uh, like it or not. So that's the, the first characteristic. The second one, um, a revolution is transformational. Uh, so when a revolution happens, the world is a different place after the revolution finishes. And this is what you know, we are starting to recognize now, but we'll see it probably four years from now or ten years from now, that the world we live in is a very, very different place than what it used to be. And the third one, and one that concerns a lot uh, someone like me that work at a large corporation, is um, when there are revolutions, revolutions are transformational, and some people win and some people lose. So uh, some people emerge of revolutions as winners, as the new uh, people that ride the wave of transformation that happens through a revolution. Some com new companies appear, but some of the companies that maybe were the leading uh, companies before the revolution, they lose and they you know, become something else or disappear. And this is something uh, we don't tend to recognize, but um, uh, the world we live today, you know, if a company is a large company uh, and is, let's say, in the Standard & Poor's 500 or whatever, or any list of the, the largest companies, the, the, the amount of time a company stays as a large company is being shrinking. So it's, uh, now on average is less than 10 years. So, and this is because of this technology revolution that, uh, that we live in. So, why we are in the middle of a technology revolution? Well, we're in a technology revolution because we are seeing a lot of technologies that are, um, you know, uh, disruptive technologies. The word disruptive technology was created by uh, an author, Clayton Christensen, that you have here uh, in this slide. And a te uh, disruptive technology is basically something that unexpectedly displaces another technology, something that comes up and that makes some, something else that was the main technology being used for you know, solving a problem uh, basically disappear. Uh, the, the best way to understand what a disruptive technology is is with this example. So you all, uh, you know, some people maybe here know, but the, the ones at least my age, you will remember that we had LPs, and that's the way we used to consume uh, music. And then uh, the tape uh, appeared, the cassette, uh, and this is how then people started uh, uh, you know, playing music, and it made the LPs almost disappear as the mainstream way of uh, listening music. And then the CD came, and the CD made, uh, and the digital made uh, you know, tapes uh, disappear. People don't have tapes uh, anymore. And what's happening now is, is even you know, more stream because the CD is also disappearing because people now consume uh, music um, directly in a digital format through either portable players or, or smartphones. And any of these technologies um, existed and was the, the leading technology at that time before another technology came that completely displaced it and completely made the other technology disappear. And that's the kind of things that, uh, that are disruptive technologies. So. Then, so let's just start thinking about a little bit what kind of things are disruptive at the moment uh, that are going to change the future. So uh, obviously predicting the future is impossible. No one knows what the future is, but you can imagine something and you can try to uh, foresee what's going to happen. That's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to focus specifically uh, around uh, some, some particular technologies. 
So the first one um, is uh, about senses. Uh, you'll hear in this presentation a lot about senses. Humans uh, have four senses, but the reality is today, you know, we have more than five senses uh, because there's a lot of things that are being used uh, to augment our senses around. And then these are the kind of things um, like uh, smartphones. Um, if you have a smartphone, um, you might not be aware, but a smartphone carries around 10 uh, different sensors on average. It has, obviously, the ones that everyone knows, like a GPS, but it also has a proximity sensor. It has a barometer, so it knows the, the pressure and it has an altitude. Um, it has uh, a compass, uh, uh, has a temperature sensor, etc., etc. And then we live in, in a, you know, I've been in the Mobile Congress the last two days, and you will see all this uh, new um, you know, wearable devices that are appearing that are basically adding sensors to, to what we do, and this is proliferating. In this example, you have um, you know, uh, uh, a balloon there that says, worry me soon. Uh, believe it or not, I have one at home. There's, uh, uh, there's a company that produces some small sensors that you can actually place it um, in, your, uh, in your plants, in your terrace, and it basically will sense what is the humidity, the temperature, and everything, and it will tell you in your smartphone when you need to water your plants. Uh, so this is obviously not something that is mainstream today, but it's kind of like a, an indication of where, where things are going. And the most interesting thing about all these sensors that are proliferating, uh, like the ones in the smartphones or the one that I mentioned to you that uh, you know, tells you when you need to water your plants, is that these sensors are connected to the internet. These are sensors that communicate and that you know, uh, send our information around about these sensors. Um, you know, we've had uh, the last few years uh, appear the, the smartwatches, which are basically, you know, sensors you carry in your watch that communicate and that augment uh, the capabilities of your watch. You have all these this bands. I have a Fitbit here that basically track um, your sleeping pattern. It tracks uh, your activity during the day and it sends information to, to the internet. And then in your smartphone, it gives you alerts about things that you do, how many steps you've done every day, whether you need to, you know, stand up and go around when you're in a meeting room, etc., etc. And the same thing is happening at home, uh, you probably heard about uh, Google acquisition of Nest. This is just the tip of the iceberg of uh, many, many, many objects that are common objects at home, like a thermostat, that are now being uh, you know, disrupted by digital technology and basically uh, connecting to the internet to allow you for capabilities. I have a thermostat at home, it's not a Nest. Uh, Nest doesn't work in Europe, uh, but I have another one from a company called Green Momit, which I basically can see from my smartphone, even I'm here in Barcelona and my house in Madrid, what is the temperature in my house, what is the humidity, and I can you know, turn on and off uh, the heating system uh, depending on what I want to do. And this is thanks to you know, uh, sensors that are placed in this thermostat and then communication that sends the information and allows you to interact with, this, uh, with these devices. And what happens with this is that all these sensors that are you know, with you all day are being used to give you, uh, you know, some sort of digital assistance. Um, if you are uh, an Android user, um, you probably have noticed that Google has developed something called Google Now that basically is sensing what you're doing and is capable of predicting things, like you need to leave because your meeting is uh, half an hour and there's a lot of traffic. Um, it also predicts, for instance, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're driving and it turns off, you can set the, the phone that automatically, when it detects you're uh, in a car, uh, it turns off certain notifications, or it turns that the SMS alerts uh, come through voice, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these are, this is probably one of the biggest revolutions that is happening now that is only beginning of how all this um, you know, information that is being collected can provide context for providing you with assistance for many things that, uh, that you want to do. And then these things are not only, you know, uh, sensors around you, but it's also another way of actually, uh, you know, communicating with the world. Uh, you know, Google has developed Google Glass. Uh, there is some virtual reality glasses that are very interesting, which is the Oculus uh, uh, Drift uh, that you have here, that are basically allowing you to then you know, augment your senses in a different way. When you are wearing something like Google Glass, you're starting seeing information about the things that you have around um, that augment the, the senses, bringing information from, uh, from the internet. So it's not only that we're carrying sensors in our, uh, in our smartphones or we're carrying sensors in, in the devices at home or we carry sensors with wearables, but it's also that our visual capabilities are being augmented by, by these new devices. And the final one, which is probably the, the least known because it's not becoming mainstream, is that you know, there's people developing very interesting technologies to put sensors inside our bodies directly. So this is not a wearable, this is not something uh, you wear like this, but these are basically sensors uh, that are formed with uh, biosensor chips that people can carry inside so doctors can actually um, you know, monitor what is happening uh, to you. This is 
something is happening thanks to nanotechnology. I was the other day uh, here in Barcelona at an event where an, an entrepreneur won a, won a prize because they've developed contact lenses that have a small chip in the contact lens that is, uh, you know, monitoring your uh, sugar uh, level. So, so if you, you have any problem uh, with sugar because you have diabetes or whatever, the contact lens actually can send a signal um, to your smartphone and alert you that you need to take insulin or do something like that. Um, there is pills um, that actually contain sensors that when you take the pill, the sensor is inside your body and can monitor uh, your condition today. And this is very revolutionary because basically what, what's going to happen is that you know, medicine will change uh, completely because today doctors only see you when you have a problem and you go to them and then they monitor what is your status. But imagine what will happen if actually doctors can monitor your status all the time and collect all that data. They'll be able to actually predict uh, sickness before the sickness uh, even happened. Uh, because they are all the time monitoring uh, your body condition. So um, they will be able to basically take care of you remotely. And the most interesting consequence of this is that, um, you know, people are going to live longer. Um, I was uh, at a talk recently where they were showing some curves about how technology affects certain things. And one of the things that has not been uh, really affected by technology today is, uh, is the how long people live. Uh, basically, um, it's been growing very slowly, linearly over the last, let's say, couple of hundred years. Uh, and then, typically, every time there is an improvement in medicine technology, then the improvement happens in the next generation. And therefore, it only makes you know, an incremental improvement on how long people live. And that's why people uh, you know, don't live 200 years or something like that. What is happening now with all these technologies, and this is what doctors are predicting, is that by remotely monitoring you all the time and knowing all the time how are you, they can predict uh, sickness, and therefore what they can do is they can extend the life of people of the current generation, uh, which will be very transformational. So one recommendation is try not to die soon, because if you live a little longer and these technologies become mainstream, then your life actually can double uh, within the, the current generation. The, the other area that is being affected by, uh, you know, technologies uh, like, like sensors and, and big data, which is basically collecting all this information from sensors and, and making uh, something about it, is, um, is the industrial technologies, what people uh, refer to the industrial internet of things. Um, you know, uh, factories are becoming much more sophisticated. Uh, factories are becoming uh, much more automized. Uh, there's ne less need of uh, people in factories, and people are kind of becoming uh, craftsmen themselves. And let me tell you, explain you a little bit what this means. So the first thing is that um, when you don't need uh, that many people in factories for manufacturing, the biggest consequence is you don't need to remotely uh, locate them in places where labor is very cheap. So there's a, there's a huge tendency in the US and a little bit happening already in Europe to bring factories closer to consumers because you don't need to put it in a place where labor is much cheaper. And this has a huge impact in terms of production because by factories being closer to consumers, you can ship um, you know, goods in a, uh, much faster. You can actually adapt things uh, much more to the local needs because you don't need to uh, have uh, you know, larger uh, quantities uh, being produced, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the other interesting thing is that even factories are moving inside the, the home. Uh, why? Well, basically, because uh, there is some technology that the last around five years has been becoming mainstream, which is 3D printing. Um, I bought my, a 3D printer this Christmas myself. Um, I built it at home. Uh, I don't recommend you to do that because it took me many, many, many hours and it's a nightmare and you need to calibrate it, etc. Uh, but it's an, it was an interesting way of actually learning how 3D printing works. And it's quite amazing when you have a 3D printer and then you start printing and a physical object starts appearing you know, out of nowhere. Uh, this is something that when you see it the first time, it's like, wow, uh, this is going to be revolutionary because imagine what will happen when people have these 3D printers, which today are expensive and are rough around the edges, but think about what happened with printers in the past, with regular 2D printers. They used to have pixels and they used to have bad quality, and today when you print in paper, you cannot distinguish from, let's say, um, a picture. So the same thing will happen with objects. The, the technology for 3D printing will improve, will become simpler to use, will have increased resolution, so you will be able to print in different materials um, with uh, less uh, you know, edges uh, around the objects, and then you'll be able to print uh, things that you need at home. So one day, you, know, you forgot uh, whatever uh, you need at home, and rather than go and buy it, you will just download the file, you will print it, and you will have it at home uh, immediately, the same way that people you know, don't develop uh, photos anymore. They just print it uh, at home. So this is going to be very uh, revolutionary and, and transformational as well. In, in my company, Telephonic R&D, we, um, we did an uh, experiment a few years ago, which is start thinking how the, the new garage, uh, you know, startups uh, always 
um, have started in garages traditionally. This is, uh, uh, you know, what uh, we've been uh, told from Silicon Valley. And the, the garages usually were just, uh, you know, a couple of engineers with some, uh, with some software. What we have, are seeing now is that the new garage is actually for physical objects. So, so you have, you know, heavy machines like laser cutters and industrial CNC machines, which are becoming very, very cheap and simple to use. 3D design software is also becoming very affordable. There's even a lot of open source uh, software, so anyone can actually go on downloading. You can have a mounting station with uh, soldering, rimming, whatever, electronics, and then you can develop software, and then you can integrate objects that are integrated into the world and connected to, to the internet. This, this was literally impossible to do uh, five years ago. It was too expensive, too complex, too complicated. Uh, so, and now this is becoming very simple, the same way that building software has become very simple the last um, 10 years. And this is why there's so many uh, you know, startups building software and so many people developing apps. The same thing is going to happen with hardware, uh, which is a very interesting trend. Um, we already seen this. There's lots of, uh, I think one of the talks before talked about makers and talk about people producing hardware. And the reason of this proliferation of, uh, of makers is precisely because of the, how these technologies have come down in price uh, big time and have um, become much simpler uh, to use without having uh, huge technical skills. Let me talk about the, another trend that is related to, to what I was talking. The, the other thing that is going to change dramatically within the next uh, 10 years are cities. Um, and uh, the population today is concentrating in cities. Uh, it's predicted that in 2020, 80% of the population will live in cities. So, so people are abandoning uh, rural areas and moving to cities. And that has a huge impact uh, because cities become larger, cities become more complicated to live. But at the same time, there's a lot of these technologies that I've been talking around that could be actually used to make uh, life in cities uh, much easier. So the first thing um, is uh, sensor networks. Uh, uh, I've talked to you about sensors that you can carry in your, uh, you know, as wearables, sensors that you can carry inside your body, uh, sensors that you can place at home to do, you know, uh, simple home automation tasks. The other thing that is happening is sensors are also becoming part of cities. Um, we've done a big deployment uh, in a city in the north of Spain called Santander, where we've placed 20,000 sensors, uh, and these sensors basically monitor everything that happens in the city. They monitor um, uh, the pollution, the temperature, they monitor the public transportation, they monitor, monitor the parking um, in the street, they monitor the, the, the garbage uh, trash, how, when they get filled, etc., etc. And this makes the, the, the whole city uh, to be a better place to live for citizens and much more efficient to, uh, to manage. One simple consequence, if you go to Santander and if you drive around the, the downtown uh, area, is when you go into one street and you're in a traffic light, you get a signal that tells you how many parking spots are on the street because there's no car park. Uh, if you drive in the city center of any city, uh, you will know that finding parking is very complicated. In fact, 40% of the traffic in, in the urban areas in the center is due to people looking for parking. So with this technology, you can actually uh, make traffic much more efficient without trying to convince people not to use uh, cars, which has been you know, the other approach that uh, people have tried. Basically, about making it much more efficient to, you know, to go to one place and then drop your car uh, somewhere. But this is only the beginning. Um, the, I think that the, the biggest consequence will be for citizens to be able to, you know, have more visibility on how the city is being managed, and this will open up uh, other opportunities. Here in Barcelona, uh, the, the city hall has already been opening up the data they have about the city. For instance, the data they have about the, uh, the bicycles in the street, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So developers can actually access this data, and then are, are starting to produce new services for uh, improving the quality in the city. The, the other thing um, that is happening is as more people concentrate in cities, um, the physical space in cities is becoming much more uh, uh, important and much more expensive. Uh, so people, there's uh, uh, a lot of people doing research on how you know, housing uh, will become when you don't have uh, space. Uh, I lived uh, 10 years of my life in Japan. In Japan, space is a very, very precious thing. People live in very small houses uh, because space is, uh, is so crowded uh, and everyone wants to be in the city that um, it's very expensive to have space. So if, if you've ever seen um, a Japanese house, many you will notice that they have they're kind of modular, so, so you have one room where you will put a futon uh, in the tatami in the floor, and this, you will sleep, and in the morning you, you fold it, and there, is, there are some uh, closets that fit exactly uh, this uh, mattress, this Japanese mattress, that you can fold it and put it there, and then the same room was your sleeping room, then becomes uh, your living room for the rest of the day, because you don't have many rooms. Uh, believe it or not, but when I was a student there, I lived in, a, in an apartment that had 18 square meters. Uh, so if this is like one, uh, basically one room. 
So one approach is what the Japanese people do, which they remove things uh, so they can use the same room for multiple uh, choices. The other one is the one I'm going to show you here um, that um, uh, is being developed at MIT, that the, the whole house is something that changes and it gets transformed depending on the usage that you want to uh, see. So you can see here that you can have a space for hanging out, then you can have uh, then a, di a dining room, then it turns into a party room, and then you know it removes all the space. and. Uh, you can have uh, um, the, the, the different parts of the, the different walls that move and adapt uh, for the, the need that you want. So this way, you don't need to have more space. People can live uh, you know, together in cities, but at the same time, you can have a better uh, quality of life. The other important thing uh, about cities uh, is transport. Um, transport is something, uh, as I mentioned, that can be improved with, uh, with technology, like the example I told you uh, about Santander or many other cities that by monitoring where are uh, parking spots, uh, people uh, drive more efficiently and then uh, there is less traffic. But the other interesting thing that is happening is how transport um, in the cities is becoming also much more clean and much more efficient uh, thanks to you know, new uh, you know, devices that we we'll use for transport. You have here some examples um, of some, uh, you know, prototypes that some companies are building for, for doing transports in cities. Um, and I want to show you one in particular that um, is very interesting because it's, all, it's made here in Spain that can actually make transport um, a much more uh, uh, efficient thing in a city. Uh, and this is the, this one. This is a car um, called uh, Hirico. Uh, it's been developed uh, by a Spanish company in the, in the Basque country. Uh, originally started as a project in the, in the MIT. And these cars, as you can see here, um, they are um, very efficient for transporting people because uh, they are modular, they can, they can turn around, they can go in, in any direction. Uh, you will see in a minute uh, when you don't need the car, um, it elevates, uh, it will come up in the video in a minute. So it actually is much more efficient uh, for parking as well because it uses less, uh, less space. And you can stack one of these cars against each other so, so you can park them there. And rather than having um, like the bicycles we have in Barcelona for, for urban transportation, then you have these sort of cars, which is, is shared, modular, doesn't occupy space, is electric, and, uh, and becomes a much more efficient way of, uh, of transporting people around cities. And the final one around cars uh, is the, the self-driven cars. This is something, uh, you know, when I started, I told you about, uh, about my daughter, uh, that she's now a bit of a one-year-old. Um, before we had uh, our daughter, my wife, uh, believe it or not, and don't, don't tell her this, that I say this in public, but she didn't have a driver's license. She's never uh, driven. She's always lived in cities, and she's never needed uh, a driver's license or a car. But when we had the, our daughter, then it became like a necessity to have more, uh, more independence and move around. So she took a driver's license, and then we were thinking probably by the time our daughter is 18 years old she will not need a driver's license because no one will drive and uh, if you think about what's going to happen within the next 10 to 20 years is that cars will be self-driven uh, and this is a reality already there's lots of prototypes there's lots of legislation and other things that are um, involved around it's not just google doing it that is actually any single car manufacturing uh, is working on uh, self-driving cars and the main consequence of this is that well, you will not need a driver's license, but also there will not be accidents, uh, and driving will be much more efficient. So there's two ways to improve, uh, three ways to improve uh, transportation. One is by, you know, sensing the city and helping people uh, go around. The other one is by looking at new, um, you know, transport uh, uh, mechanisms, like the Hiriko car that I showed you. But the third one is actually that, you know, uh, machines drive for you, uh, which, you know, becomes much more efficient and becomes uh, less dangerous, obviously. The, the other thing that is happening, um, uh, and it's a big, big uh, trend in the industry, is uh, our drones. Uh, drones are these, uh, you know, uh, these planes that, uh, you know, they're not uh, uh, driven by anyone. They're, they're managed remotely. Uh, they're popular because, you know, the U.S. uses in work, but they also have a lot of uh, other applications that are, you know, less uh, dangerous, let's say. Um, they're currently being used for lots of things in agriculture, uh, for uh, cartography to collect maps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, one thing that is happening, and you probably saw the announcement about uh, Amazon made uh, recently, is that uh, drones could actually be used for efficiently delivering goods. Uh, one of the problems is uh, 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 of living in cities. You need to go and buy. If you use, uh, uh, you know, e-commerce and you buy through the internet, then you need to be at home when they deliver the goods, and delivering goods is expensive. So, um, in some countries, it's not very efficient. But imagine what will happen. If if you can actually you know, have a drone that will pick a package and then deliver it to your home uh, without any, any human uh, involved. This might seem science fiction, but it's actually a project that Amazon is already working, and there's some countries that are already trialing um, these sort of applications for, for drones. 
And the final one before finishing is um, all these things that I told you have one problem, uh, which they consume a lot of energy. Uh, so energy in some countries like Spain is a very precious thing and is very expensive. Um, uh, fortunately, there is a lot of uh, new sources of energy that are being created, so we have less dependency in things like, uh, like petrol. Uh, but um, energy is uh, something that will become much more important in the future because all these technologies that are around actually consume uh, uh, energy. So the, the good news is that there's many people also researching on how energy will be produced and consumed and distributed in the future. So the first uh, uh, thing that is going to happen within the next 10 years or so is that you know, you'll be able to charge things wirelessly. Uh, so if you travel like I do and you carry many devices, uh, you probably have the nightmare of carrying like, tons of different charges for your computer, for your, lab, for your tablet, for your smartphone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Even for cigarettes now, if you have an electronic cigarette, you need to have a charger for your cigarette. So um, there's lots of companies already doing uh, wireless charging. Uh, the moment this becomes uh, much more standardized, then you will have wireless charging you know, in all over the places. So basically, you will not have to charge things because just by moving around, you know, energy will be uh, floating and then your devices will, uh, will get charged. There's a consequence of that, which is actually if people carry uh, charging devices with themselves, the cinetic energy that we produce when we move can actually help recharge things. And there's already prototypes of things that actually recharge just by being close to, to, to the human body. And these are this, uh, these super batteries. So, so these are basically uh, batteries that are being created to, to, to take the, the cinetic energy that the body is producing to be able to charge the, the devices that, uh, that you carry yourself uh, wirelessly. The final one is that um, the energy market itself is not something very efficient. And uh, in the US, they had a lot of problems in the past. Uh, in Spain, we've had recent problems as well about how energy is not the way it's being produced, but it's how it's being distributed. And uh, uh, the, what will happen in the future is actually uh, energy will be distributed in a, in a different way, more in a peer-to-peer -peer way. In other words, if anyone is capable of producing energy, uh, you cannot uh, store that energy for long. So energy needs, needs to be either moving or stored somewhere else. But if everyone is producing energy, then you can actually deliver energy peer-to-peer. -peer. So energy will be moving around people, and this will facilitate how, how people consume uh, energy in a much more efficient way. So uh, to finalize, um, I just want to tell you that everything you've seen uh, in this presentation um, has four main technologies that are behind everything you've seen here, four technologies. What are these four technologies, uh, these four disruptive technologies? Well, the first one is what people refer to as the Internet of Things. Uh, or yesterday I was with uh, some friends, they call it uh, living services. So these are basically um, sensor networks that are capable of connecting things, and things could be whatever, as you saw in the presentation, could be, could be cars, could be cities, could be uh, your body, could be your uh, home devices, etc., that are connected uh, to the internet and are becoming then alive. They produce information, uh, etc., etc. The other one is ultra broadband internet. You've noticed here that everything I've talked to implies that everything is connected. So if everything is connected, and we're not talking about connecting people anymore, we're talking about connecting lots of different things, then you need a lot more, much more bandwidth. So, so bandwidth is going to become much more important. And already, you know, with new technologies like 4G and now uh, and in the future 5G, with fiber coming to almost every single place uh, within the next 10 years, then you will have a much more efficient uh, connectivity that will be uh, big enough for carrying all this uh, data that is being produced that has to be uh, distributed. The third one is that infrastructure, the way we know it today, has to change. So infrastructure today is highly centralized, and people, and what I mean infrastructure, I talk about from, from energy to all the way to, uh, you know, servers uh, and, uh, and intelligence in the network. Uh, the way uh, infrastructure is done today, in, in a centralized way, if you want, is very inefficient. It's not going to scale very well for all the needs that we're going to have for more, much more infrastructure. So infrastructure will get uh, distributed, and that's another consequence that some people are happening. So imagine... You know, you, if you have a, a house with pay TV, you have a set-top box at home. Uh, so imagine if that set-top box is part of a network and that actually allows people to, you know, store objects throughout the, uh, the, the Internet. We did a calculation um, in Spain. In Spain, with the amount of people that have set-top boxes at home for pay TV, if you share those and you share some of the resources, both the, the processing power and the storage, you, you can actually produce a content distribution network that will cover 40% of the world. And we're talking about only one country like, like Spain. So distributed infrastructure is the way to scale for all the needs that we're going to have of computing, storage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the final one is big data. 
all these things that I've told you produce a lot of data. And the main uh, advantage of uh, producing that data is not the data itself, but it's actually the insights that you can get out of the data. And that's what today is being referred as big data. Big data is nothing new. I mean, every few years, it changes the name. When I, uh, you know, when I uh, did my PhD, it used to be called uh, machine learning. Uh, then it became called data mining. Now it's called big data. It's basically fundamentally the same thing. It's collecting a lot of data and using sophisticated analytics to be able to produce insights out of the data. Because data itself is not valuable. What is valuable is the information that you can extract from data. So many of the things you've seen in this presentation like, for instance, um, the advances in medicine are, are something that requires not only that data is being produced and collected, but it's actually being analyzed to be able to take decisions. And that's one of the, uh, that's the fourth, uh, let's say, biggest trend. There's been so much advance in, in analytics, in, uh, in uh, you know, processing uh, technology, in database technology, et cetera, et cetera, the last years that is allowing um, this to become a reality of analyzing data in, in real time. So these are kind of like the, uh, to conclude my talk, these are kind of the four um, you know, disruptive technologies that are happening today uh, that are going to enable many other changes in the future that, uh, as I said at the beginning, will uh, you know, produce this, uh, this digital revolution that we're in. So now the question is, uh, uh, before I finish, this could be a reality, what I told you, some things are a reality already, some things are not. Some things are things that are either being researched or planned, but the, the most complicated thing, if this doesn't become a reality, will be how people actually absorb these things. Uh, so humans, uh, for, throughout the last 100 years, they've been absorbing technology at a faster rate uh, every time. So if you think about, for instance, uh, uh, media, so when the newspapers came, it took X amount of years for becoming mainstream. Then, then radio came, and it became mainstream much faster. And then the TV came and became mainstream much, much faster. And then the internet came and became mainstream much faster. And now the smartphones and the mobile internet has come and has become mainstream uh, much faster. But how, how much you know, technology and advance can people absorb uh, for all these things to become a reality because sometimes it's not a problem of technology itself But it's how people actually are capable of uh, you know ad absorbing uh, the changes produced by technology So with this uh, reflection I want to conclude here and since we have five minutes uh, if you guys we can have uh, some questions from the audience Thank you very much Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Hi, that was really interesting. Um, we're actually um, from Telefonica on the Think Big project, uh -huh. um, which is helping young entrepreneurs. And I was just wondering, obviously you've had a really good education in this. How important do you think it is for us to be educating young people these digital skills so that rather than being consumers of this amazing technology mm. that they can maybe be makers as well? I think it's very important because, uh, and this, links, this question links very well with the end of my presentation. Uh, the reason why people are capable of absorbing technology much, much faster is because they understand it. And basically because they understand it, they are capable of, of doing things. So I think it's very important that um, education, education changes in a way that um, you know, people understand a little bit what is the logic behind all these things that happen. So I've been uh, uh, advocating and I've been you know, posting a lot of articles in my Twitter account about uh, teaching people computer science at any age, at, in, irrespectively of whether you are going to be a programmer or not. Because if you understand the logic of software, then when you're manipulating, let's say, a smartphone, an app, or anything, then you can actually understand it much better, and then you can use it uh, faster. So I think education is very important. But in spite of that, I think that you know, technology itself is becoming also easier to, to consume. Uh, my daughter, believe it or not, with less than one year, she will pick up a, a, an iPhone and open it. And, and she, no one to, told her how to do that, but she will pick, she probably saw us doing it, etc. So she hits the bottom, goes like this, and boom, opens the, the phone. Uh, and, and now it's capable of, you know, going to the, to the iPad and, uh, and playing something. And when I put the laptop, she's trying to touch the screen of the laptop, thinking that there should be a touch screen. So, so these are kind of things that, you know, no one has taught them because they're too small, but technology is becoming uh, very intuitive, so people are, will absorb it. These are what people refer to the, the digital natives. I think the next generation, everyone will be digital native. Everyone will you know, grow up uh, surrounded by technology, so, so they'll absorb it. But education at the same time, I think, is, uh, is very important. 
In Think Big, you guys collaborate with the Mozilla Foundation, for instance, which are very activist in terms of teaching people uh, about the internet uh, at any age, even kids, because if you understand how the internet works, you will appreciate more the internet and then you will be able to you know, use it uh, much better. Thank you. That was a terrific presentation. Thank you very much. What's Telefonica doing to be in the winning group in 10 years? What are the single most important thing or the three things that you believe Telefonica is doing to be in that group and do not become irrelevant as many other industries and companies will become? So if you go back here, <coughs> we are fundamentally an infrastructure company uh, and provide connectivity. That's the main business of Telefonica. And I think Keep, keep investing uh, on new networks uh, will keep us in the game of not being irrelevant in, in our traditional business. So, so Telefonica is deploying fiber um, in Spain, as you know, it stays deploying 4G in pretty much uh, every, every country we are. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is <clears throat> uh, connectivity is only part of the business, right? If you only do connectivity, you, uh, you might become an infrastructure player, but don't participate in the bigger changes that are, hap that are happening. So, so uh, we've created, and in fact today it was announced that it's been reinforced, uh, a, a project inside Telefonica uh, called Telefonica Digital to precisely push um, you know, the company towards uh, digital services. And by digital services, we have uh, units that are uh, related to Internet of Things, we have units related to big data, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these technologies that you see here is something we believe, as a company, we need to be able to master it, to understand it, and, and to contribute, because this will become part of how the future uh, evolves. Now, that said, um, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Because as I told you before, if you're a large company, statistically, you're going to uh, stop being a large company within 10 years. So the odds are against any, any large company. Uh, but I think uh, if the management recognizes that you know, your business is going to change within 10 years and they start building all these capabilities internally, then you have uh, a better chance to stay relevant. Any other questions? All right, so we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much. Carlos, thank you very, very much for that.